Hello there my very good friends, Andy Murray here in my dimly lit apartment with another breakdown of the final episode this time of WWE's The Undertaker The Last Ride which aired on the WWE Network just a couple of days ago. Now there's a lot to unpack with this episode as there always is but you probably already know the biggest takeaway. The Undertaker claims that he's finally content with the idea of retirement but there's an asterisk that word the viking thing there's an asterisk there's a caveat because of course there is it's wrestling this is the undertaker nobody ever truly retires and he said that if vince mcmahon needs him for something well he might well reconsider and friends you all know what that means but there's also plenty of other things to talk about as well and we don't want that one big story to kind of bury anything else so we're going to keep that till the end so with that in mind, let's get this show on the goddamn road. I'm Andy for What Culture Wrestling, and here are 10 things that we learned from WWE's The Undertaker, The Last Ride, Final Chapter. Number 10, Triple H didn't believe he was done. So if you go back to the previous chapter of The Last Ride, you might remember the scene between The Undertaker and Vince McMahon after Extreme Rules 2019. He's just had his awesome match as the Graveyard Dogs alongside Roman Reigns and he's saying, Vince, that's probably it for me. I'm considering stepping away. And Vince basically says to him, well, your choice, big man. I'm okay with that. But Triple H, well, he, like a lot of us would have, had we been privy to this information at the time, saw right through it. He knew that The Undertaker's itch probably wouldn't go away unless he was able to scratch it with one last singles match. Now, the Extreme Rules match was awesome, but it wasn't the big singles bout that we know The Undertaker for. It wasn't the legacy-defining one-on-one scrap that he made his later career on. Triple H figured that until he had the opportunity to do that, he would never truly retire. And, well, Papa Paul, he was right. Number 9. His career-long ritual at MSG Madison Square Garden, the most famous arena in the world. The Undertaker, the most famous zombie wrestler in the... They go together hand in hand is what I'm trying to say. Taker has obviously performed there a lot over his 30 plus year career. And every single time he goes there, he has one simple ritual. Gets ready in the dressing room, starts walking his way to the gorilla position, ready to go to the ring. But as he's doing so, he stops. He spends a few minutes looking at two particular photographs on the wall, one of Elvis Presley and one of Muhammad Ali. He says that this helps put everything in perspective for him. It keeps him grounded, keeps him humble, and it blows his mind that, you know, now you've got this photo from WrestleMania 20. It's him dropping the big leg on old Kane. It's right beside the Elvis photo. Blows his mind that he's right there alongside his very childhood heroes. And, you know, he's kind of one of them himself now, and he has been for a long, long time. But pretty cool to see some humility from a guy held in such high esteem around the wrestling business nonetheless. Number 8. Last year's Smackdown promo only makes sense now. Cast your minds back to September 2019. Now, it's very difficult, I know, I can only remember last week for God's sake. But if you cast your mind back to then, there was a random Smackdown appearance in MSG from The Undertaker. He showed up, he said some Undertaker things, and then he smashed Sami Zayn. Now, at the time, this felt like it came out of nowhere. You looked at it and the response was, what the hell was that for? Seems pointless, right? Well, when you watch the, this episode of The Last Ride, it starts making a little bit of sense. WWE gave the opportunity to The Undertaker to appear at MSG on this show because the dead man figured it would probably be the last time he'd ever get to do anything in the world's most famous arena. So, when you think about it that way, it's just the company giving their loyal 30-year employee and certified golden goose for much of that time a nice little opportunity to wave goodbye to the building it kind of makes sense. Although, the segment was still kind of crap. I'm sorry, Undertaker. It just wasn't good, but glad you're happy. Number seven. The Undertaker told his dad that his face paint was his war mask. One of the coolest stories on this episode that we get goes back to the 90s. It's a raw taping. We're in Houston. The Undertaker's backstage, and he's got his dad with him. Now, 
This was quite an eye-opening experience for Senior Taker, as we're going to call him. Didn't quite have the best working knowledge of what went into pro wrestling, so when he saw his son preparing, he was like, Hey, what are you doing with that silly pair of boots? And why are you a zombie? Why? I should know you're a zombie. I'm your dad. But the thing that caused the biggest rambuction, shall we say, between the two, was when he saw The Undertaker putting his eye makeup on. He was like, what's that? What, what, what are you doing here? What's this? Is this part of the act? Blah, 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 blah. This led to kind of a bit of jokey machismo between the two, little cracking jokes here and there, until The Undertaker said, well, hey man, that's my war mask. So, the whole thing comes off pretty wholesome, on the whole. It's the father, the son, bonding over the inherently ridiculous and silly and daft art of pro wrestling, and you get a sense of pride from The Undertaker through this story because his dad was never 100% up to this point supportive of his choices. He had the opportunity to pursue baseball. He went to this silly pantomime world instead. But this comes across as like a moment of acceptance and it's really nice to see that between a father and a son regardless of the son's lofty status in the business. Number 6. Why Vince McMahon was worried about The Undertaker in 2002 Randy Orton pops by on this episode and he has a story from an episode of Smackdown in 2002. It was him versus The Undertaker. It only went about 5 minutes, but Orton remembers it vividly because it was such a giving performance from a veteran who really didn't need to go out of his way to do that. He gave Orton a lot of offense, even though it was a really short runtime. Now, Vince McMahon, he didn't quite like this. He said, hey, Undertaker, why are you giving this rookie so much in this match? Why are you making him look so good? Why are you going out of your way? You've done too much. Vince thought that the layout of the match would harm The Undertaker, but The Undertaker was having none of it. He said, I was just trying to make the kid, and, well, when you saw Orton's reaction, he was probably bricking himself there and then, but he thought it was really, really cool. He promised to repay the legend for what he'd done someday in the future, and, well, they've had their fair share of scraps ever since, so it's safe to say that it all worked out in the end. Number 5. AJ Styles didn't ask Vince McMahon about WrestleMania 36. There was a while before WrestleMania 36 when AJ Styles thought about picking up the phone saying to old Vince McMahon, hey, do you think The Undertaker would be interested in working with me at the biggest show of the year? He'd seen him, uh, The Undertaker that is, on Steve Austin's podcast, The Broken Skull Sessions on the WWE Network, talking about maybe working one more match, maybe doing WrestleMania, and it got AJ's mind going. But what he decided to do was bypass Vince entirely. He went directly to Taker. Interesting approach, kind of not roping the WWE chairman and the most powerful man in wrestling into all of this, but he went straight to Taker, and Taker was interested, right? But he wasn't quite sure if he could pull it off. So he said, essentially, leave it with me, I'll have a think, I'm interested, I just don't know. And AJ smartly replied saying, well, whatever's good with you is good with me. And we obviously found out what was good for both of them because the match happened and the Boneyard was the best B-movie of the whole damn year. Number 4. The Undertaker ribbed AJ via Vince Now, you know The Undertaker, he's this old professional guy, he's the last basking of kayfabe and all this stuff, but he loves a bloody good rib as well. And here's a little story proving that even at this advanced stage of his career, he's still got it in him. So AJ was... I don't want to say left hanging about the WrestleMania 36 match, but it wasn't certain. Undertaker decided that he was cool with it, he wanted to do it, he wanted the match to go ahead, but he thought he was going to have a little fun as well. So we phoned Vince McMahon, told him the good news, and then said, hey, actually, let's screw with this guy, let's tell him that I want to wrestle somebody else instead. So Vince phones up AJ and goes, hey pal, I'm real sorry, but The Undertaker wants to wrestle some kid from Tennessee instead. Now, AJ, to his credit, didn't fall for this and recognised it as just a bit of playful old banter from the old dad lads, although AJ's pretty old himself, so I guess the granddad lads? I don't know, I'm really running out of steam with this goddamn thing. Either way, it's a funny little story. Imagine these guys kind of prodding each other in the ribs the next time they saw them. Good fun. Yeah. Thumbs up. Number 3. It dropped a massive hint on his WWE future. 
An interesting part of this episode of the documentary was the footage that we saw of The Undertaker at the Performance Centre working through drills and various bits and pieces of practice with some of the bigger athletes training at WWE's state-of-the-art facility. Now, that kind of gets the cogs going a little bit. It makes you wonder if he's going to follow in Shawn Michaels' footsteps and maybe end up at the PC on a semi-regular or full-time basis training the stars of the future. Now, don't take that as gospel. It's just something I've read off the episode. But we kind of make sense, right? I mean, you can't imagine a guy like The Undertaker, even if he can't wrestle again, is going to want to quit the business entirely. And there's probably a wealth of stuff right up here that could benefit the wrestlers of the future. Plus, he talks openly about wanting to give back as well. So it all comes together. It's just a question of whether or not he'd want to uproot everything and move to Orlando for this, or if he'd just drop by every now and then to throw some knowledge at those cheeky little trainees. Either way, I'm sure he'd have plenty to add. Number two, his brother died just before the Boneyard shoot. The Boneyard match was a big, crazy, cinematic, out of control affair, and we at Walk Culture were fortunate enough to be able to uh, secure some exclusive behind the scenes stuff, some snaps, some stories, all kinds of goodness that we've covered before on this very channel and indeed on the website. So check that stuff out. What it means essentially is that a lot of the behind the scenes stuff on the Boneyard match that was covered on this episode, well, you know, this <laughs> sounds really condescending, but we kind of already knew because of the, you know, the information we'd received and so forth. But the biggest thing on this episode is the revelation that just before they started filming the Boneyard, before they began that elaborate process, The Undertaker learned that his brother Tim had actually tragically passed away from a heart attack. Now, obviously, this hit the man extremely hard. He learned of it from his niece. He then had to go and inform various other family members. And you can only imagine the pain, the stress, the heartache that this would cause right before this colossal in the undertaking, really. The Boneyard match was a big, grueling shoot. And to receive that kind of news before it must have been the hardest thing in the world. So it's a credit to The Undertaker then that at a time when his heart, his soul, his body and his mind just wanted to grieve the tragic passing of his brother, he was able to get through this match. That's, that's a serious show of character. And to make matters worse, like a week later, Michelle McCool learned that her nephew had passed away in a car accident. Just a really horrible time in general for that family and man, fair play to them. They're Strong, strong people, and these stories show that. And at number one, he's finally content. So the thing about pro wrestling retirements, as we know, is that they rarely stick. I mean, Terry Funk exists, for God's sake. But, you know, with The Undertaker, we've heard stories over the years, never directly from the man himself, but a lot of talk about how he's thinking about stepping away, this was his last match, yada, yada, yada. It's been going on for years. Never before have we heard anything as convincing as what we got on this episode, however. Undertaker's sitting there, he's got a tear in his eye, he's getting all emotional, he's content with the idea of retirement, and in AJ Styles he found the perfect opponent to wrestle on his way out the door. Now, whatever happens next, it's The Undertaker, right? He's earned the right to make that decision and he has more than earned the right to a happy, healthy, quiet, peaceful retirement on his own terms. There's the caveat, of course, if Vince McMahon needs me, I might come back. But, you know, personally, I've never been so convinced that The Undertaker might be dumb. Don't know about you guys, but hey, go and let us know in the comments section below. Anyway, guys, that's the end of it. My yammering pish is over. Uh, we've ran through the final episode of this wonderful documentary series on the WWE Network. Now, I think on a whole, this documentary series is maybe one of the best things WWE have produced exclusively for the network. We know these things have a tendency to not be particularly impartial and there are problems here and there and things are really transparent and sometimes you just want to pick little things apart and go, you're lying there, WWE, you scamps. But this one, man, it was just a really welcome pulling back the curtain on the career of the man behind one of the most legendary characters in the game and one of the most guarded wrestlers of all time. And if you think about it in that context, I think it was a resounding success. But fire off your hot takes in the comment section below because that's what really matters. 
And then you can like, you can share, you can subscribe, you can ring the bell for notifications. You can do all of these things. Ring your friend and tell them about the video. Don't do that, that'd be weird, but do all the other things. Then you can find us on Twitter at WhatCultureWWE and myself at Andy H. Murray, where you can tell me how wrong I am. Goodbye.